Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sarah, and I work with the Living Archives Project, where we are collecting stories of how various communities were impacted by COVID-19 in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County. Today is February 15th, 2023, and this week there were 164 reported cases of COVID-19 in Charlotte, Mecklenburg County, which actually shows a decrease of 23% over the last two weeks. Therefore, each subject is comfortable not wearing a mask. Would you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Sonia Harper, and I am the director here at Mecklenburg County's Department of Criminal Justice Services. That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, would you briefly describe your physical appearance for us? Uh, I am mixed race. Um, my father's black. My mom was a uh, Caucasian. I'm about five foot ten, um, 115 pounds, and you know, skinny mini. Um, uh, again, I'm mixed race, so kind of a beige complexion, green eyes, long, curly, uh, dark hair. Awesome. Thank you. You have beautiful eyes. Thank you. Yeah. So how long have you been the director at the criminal justice? Um, coming up on seven years now. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And how long have you been living in, are you from Charlotte or did you move from elsewhere? Um, I moved here when I started the job. So not a native, uh, Charlottean, but a native North Carolinian. Okay. So, yeah. Awesome. And so what kind of stirred your interest in being the director of the criminal justice department? <laughs> I've worked in criminal justice for over 20 years now. And so, I mean, it was my field of study in college and I've been fortunate enough to, you know, work in my field, you know, since, uh, since college. And um, so it was an opportunity. I was in Washington, D.C. before. So this is an opportunity to come, you know, closer to home and um, just an opportunity to just kind of work in a larger portfolio of um, criminal justice uh, types of programs and services. So awesome. that's a good fit. Would you be able to kind of briefly share with us some of the programs that you guys provide here? Oh, we do lots of stuff here at CJS. So, um, you know, we uh, manage the pretrial services program for the county. So we are providing risk assessments and facilitating releases from the jail. Um, as well as providing supervision for people who have pending charges but can safely be released, you know, and remain in the community while they're waiting for their court dates. Uh, we run the recovery courts here, so we uh, provide court-directed substance abuse and mental health services for people that are on probation. Uh, we operate reentry uh, here, so for folks that are coming out of uh, state and federal prisons and returning to Mecklenburg County, we work with those folks to help them reintegrate back into our communities. Our forensics team here does the uh, psychological assessments uh, for the courts. Uh, we also do uh, mental health uh, diversion, um, uh, jail diversion. So folks that are in the jail that have significant mental health that can be better served in the community, we work with um, getting those folks connected with services. And we are also the ones that are responsible for the local criminal justice data. So, wow. yeah, so there's that's love. a full load. Yeah, that's just a piece of it. That's so that, that's the primary <laughs> stuff. We've got a lot going on here. But uh, yeah. So I can imagine all that you guys do for the community and with those that are in and out of the system, prison system and jails. Um, I bet they were really impacted the last few years, especially with the, the quarantines and the pandemic mm -hmm. how did that how did you see that impact you know i think like particularly at the start of the pandemic there were just a lot of unknowns um but you know of course there was the the public health directives and you know they were coming about just local state and national and so i, I do recall like at the very beginning you know we got that directive is that you know you know, this, you know, the stay at home order, you know, was going into place. And so for us, um, you know, across local government, um, you know, the vast majority of our services and things, we were having to just transition to go remotely. Um, because again, you know, at that early stages, you, you know, that we were, um, you know, really just what was considered to be essential services were going to remain open. Um, you know, staff, we were being, you know, sent home to work remotely. That was you know, we don't do a lot of remote work in criminal justice typically. So that was going to be a big pivot for us. Um, the other thing is, too, is, you know, a lot of the population that come into criminal justice, I mean, you know, don't necessarily have a significant amount of resources. Mm -hmm. And so that was going to be the really tricky thing for us, like coming out the door. It was like, OK, we're we're closing, you know, our facility. Um, you know, everything was closing, um, but we still have to serve the folks in our community. And, you know, how are we going to do that? Yeah. 
And, um, you know, when we got the directives, um, you know, coming down to, to let us know that, yeah, the stay at home orders and things were going into place, we really had about three days to kind of figure all of that out. Um, so for our populations, I mean, we have a lot of folks that kind of cycle in and out of our programs that are homeless. Um, we have a lot of folks that, you know, are um, housing insecure. Um, you know, we knew like here within the department, we had made investments over the past, you know, the previous few years in technology. So we knew like we had the capacity to put a lot of our things out there remotely. The kicker was, is how do our clients connect to that? So, um, you know, very fortunate to have a really creative staff here. Um, also very fortunate to have, you know, a, be in a county that has, you know, significant resources and has made the investments in criminal justice over the years. And so our big thing was, again, how do we keep people connected? And I would say one of the most significant things that, you know, that we were able to do that made a huge difference is um, um, we started providing people with um, temporary cell phones. Wow. Um, so we were able to move our things onto remote platforms. We were able to do virtual meetings and, um, you know, things like that. But clients didn't have the technology. I mean, if you're homeless, you, you know, phones us up and, you know, you most likely have. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, we were able to kind of, you know, again, and we did all this in like 72 hours, which was um, pretty amazing. But um, but that was the big thing. And so, I mean, for the most part, we were able to keep most of our folks here in the department connected um, to the folks here that were working with them. And, um you know, did an excellent job, but I mean, it was, it was, it was hard for, you know, it was hard for everybody, but it was hard in particular for a lot of people who, um, um, you know, again, that, that received services here. So, cause with those shutdowns too, you also saw the closure of a lot of service, um, jobs and, um, mm -hmm. um, a lot of jobs in hospitality and, you know, food service and things. And a lot of folks in, that are justice involved work in those industries. So at the same time, we were seeing a significant number of our people just, um, wow. you know, also finding themselves out of work, you know, yeah. very quickly. So there was a lot also as things went on, um, you know, people's needs became greater. Yeah. Um, and so it was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was tricky. Um, but I think, you know, overall, um, you know, I think we did the best that best that we possibly could with what we had to work with. Yeah. Would you say, how many people would you say you served in the system? Would it be in the tens of thousands, smaller, just a rough estimate? On any given day in CJS, um, you know, we have probably, we probably have close, like, we tend to stay kind of in the ballpark across all of our services, probably close to about 2,400 um, 2, people in the, in the community. Okay. Yeah. And so with that, with the temporary cell phones and things like that, how did that work? That, so they would check out phones for a certain amount of time? No, I mean, we, we issued folks phones. So that was the thing, you know, we've got, given a phone. yeah. So we have case managers and stuff throughout the department, through all the services. So they're the primary points of contact for, you know, the folks that receive yeah. services. So that was kind of one of the things the case manager started was like, a, you know, having those conversations like, Hey, do you have, you know, do you have technology? Do you have access? Do you have a phone? Do you have a computer? Do you have, you know, Wi-Fi? So it's kind of like, what do you have? Um, and you know, if folks didn't have, then what we did is we were able to issue them temporary cell phone in a 90 day, you know, plan just coming out the gate, get you, you know, get folks started. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and then as time, you know, kind of went on, if folks needed, you know, kind of assistance, you know, some folks were able to kind of pick up and continue the plans on their own and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was great. Um, but folks that didn't, you know, we were able to continue, you know, kind of helping them. them. Yeah. So that they could stay connected. You mentioned that you also a portion of those that you work with here could also be housing insecure. And especially mm -hmm. during the pandemic, mm -hmm. that the housing insecurity increased a lot. Mm -hmm. um, what were some ways that the CJS, mm -hmm. like, yeah. CJS uh, supported those who were housing insecure? Well, housing is a big thing for us just in general. Um, you know, there's very strong correlations between housing and recidivism. Mm. And, you know, for people to just to be successful, um, you know, um, you know, be successful and not get out there and kind of re-engage and stuff in criminal activity. I mean, housing is a big part of that. So, you know, we probably at least about five years in and stuff, we started a housing program here within the department. So that is something that we're able to provide for folks that that need it. Um 
the way that kind of works is, you know, we work with um, private property owners and things and folks in the community um, who are interested in kind of working with this population. And so we work with them to be able to develop and develop housing. Um, and so we had a number of people who were in housing already. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like I mentioned, a lot of folks end up losing jobs um, in the way our housing kind of works. is like when we move you in, we help, you know, pay the associated costs, but we're also working with you to get a job and things. So you kind of, you know, the, the, the person starts to gradually kind of pick up the costs and stuff until they're able to maintain it on their own. Um, so we had a lot of people, you know, that, yeah, were able to maintain the housing on their own, but then they lost their jobs. So we were, you know, needed that assistance. We were able to come in. We saw an increase in the need in housing um, with also with some of our you know clients across services, because that was the other thing. I mean, again, a lot of folks were losing work. Um, with a lot of the closures. And so, um, so yeah, so we did see, you know, folks that were in need. Um, and so, uh, the folks that we had availability and were able to place in, you know, in, in housing and work with, you know, community partners. I mean, we, we did that. Um, and we made just a kind of a commitment just here within the department that, you know, particularly folks that were at housing and that were losing their jobs. Um, we made a commitment here in the department that we weren't going to put anyone out of housing. Mm -hmm. You know, if they found themselves in that situation, um, then, you know, we were going to find a way to be able to continue to work with, you know, work with that person and work with, you know, the, the housing owner and stuff to make sure that, mm-hmm. you know, everybody, you know, kept a roof over their head. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's amazing that you guys were able to do that and step in, in that really high need time. Yeah. And like I said, and this was all happening in very short windows. I mean, it was happening very, very fast. And, um, you know, and, you know, and again, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we found a way to do it. I mean, I've got an incredible team here and, yeah. um, you know, and, um, we did, we, we made it work and, you know, it's, it's work to be very proud of. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. So before we started the interview, you and I did this activity together called the mm-hmm. hand map. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anything from your hand map that you would like to share with us today? Um, I think, you know, one of the questions you had on there was, you know, the, your, the feelings when you think about COVID, you know, what are the things that come to mind? And, um, and I got to thinking about just, you know, at the very beginning, um, you know, and I think like my words were like fear, anxiety, and the unknowns. Um, and I feel like, yeah, that was the state that I think a lot of us were in. It was just like, you know, um, you know, there's this virus out there that no one's ever heard of before. It's, you know, it's airborne. It's, you know, we were kind of, you know, in the early stages, you know, you're seeing all the things on the news and you, I don't know, you kind of, kind of sort of like on the news, just sort of watched it gradually kind of move across the globe. And so it was just sort of, you know, you're kind of sitting there waiting as like, it's going to be here. And, um, you know, but I mean, there's just so much we we didn't know. Um, and I think that was the, the thing that was it is, I mean, there was just, um, particularly in the early, the early stages. I mean, there was just, you know, um, again, I mean, there were just things we didn't know and you were watching, you know, um, you know, the news reports and stuff about, you know, the number of people who were, were dying from it. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, I think that was just, you know, that was kind of always in the back of everyone's head was just, you know, you know, you, you, you're focused on, you know, of course the work and what we do here. Um, but you know, we've all got, you know, families and friends and, you know, so you're also at the same time mm-hmm. really trying to, you know, make decisions or manage, like, how am I going to do this at, you know, how are we, what are we going to do at home? I mean, you know, you couldn't find toilet paper, you know, it was yeah. just like everything just kind of was in a, in a, you know, everything, I felt like everything was really frazzled and stuff at mm-hmm. that time. And, um, so, I mean, it was, it was a lot to, lot to navigate, but those were our things. I think a lot of people were afraid Um, and we were afraid because there were things we didn't know. And I think, yeah, anxiety was really high because I mean, it was just, you know, you're like, yeah, a lot of folks were just kind of sitting on the edge and you just didn't know if you were going to, you know, were you going to stay on the edge or were you going to fall or were you going to, you know, um, be able to kind of get back to steady ground. So, yeah. 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 Especially like you said, even with work, three days to just Mm -hmm. as the director of all these programs, I can't imagine the pressure of, I have to make sure all my staff is prepped Mm -hmm. and ready and secure Mm -hmm. as well as all the people you serve. I Mm -hmm. mean, you have all these people under you. And so it, I can imagine the feeling of unknown and overwhelmed anxiety and just, Oh my gosh, what's going on? Yeah. 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 
was a lot. I mean, and, you know, the, the team and stuff, you know, here, I mean, we were, so, there was about 72 of us in the department here. And so, you know, and that was the thing too. I mean, everybody was feeling that, um, you know, there's just, we didn't know. Um, but like I said, we, when we got the instruction is that, yeah, we're, you know, things are going to have to go offline, you know, the stay at home order was going in place. Um, you know, we were having to make qu- uh, quick decisions, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, you need to make, you know, you always want to make, you know, great decisions and be like, you know, the best at that. But sometimes yeah. you're like in a position it was like, I just need to make the least bad decision, you know, yeah. um, based on like what's on the table. Um, and that was the thing is that, you know, um, I mean, I had no doubt in the stuff that we could do it. We could pull it off. I mean, again, I'm an incredibly talented and dedicated team here. I mean, we were, I was like, we're, we're going to make this work now. I don't know what it's going to look like in the end, but I mean, it's going to work. Um, but that was the thing too, is, you know, again, there was just so many things that, you know, we, you know, didn't know. And people were also just kind of, you know, trying to, to manage things and stuff at home. And, you know, you, you know, you had to be sensitive to that. And at the same time as, you know, it's, um, yeah, I think it was a little stressful. You know, people were really they were looking for answers, but you know, sometimes we just didn't have the answers because again, I mean, there was just, you know, mm-hmm. there were things we just didn't know. I mean, this was something that, you know, mm-hmm. hadn't been experienced before. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so yeah. Yeah. How do you feel like you were personally impacted? You know, I think I was, you know, kind of in that same boat as everyone. I think, you know, again, just at, at home, um, you know, again, you're watching the news stories and you're, you know, um, you know, following what, you know, is coming out through public health and, you know, um, following, you know, what the CDC is putting out there. And, um, you know, and I think like the death count too, I mean, just Mm -hmm. kind of watching those numbers and, you know, and uh, for, you know, for me, it was just, um, you know, I was worried about my family, you know, like my, my dad is older and, you know, and they, you know, so I was like, you know, dad, dad doesn't, dad can't catch this, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've got uh, great nieces in the family. So we had little, little babies and stuff. So we were like, too, like, what do we need to do to protect, you know, them, Mm -hmm. um, remote school. That was, that was interesting. Um, in addition to, you know, everything here, it was, um, you know, my, um, have a nephew that lives with me. And so it was also too, you know, we're trying to navigate, you know, um, you know, what the school was putting out. And so I'm so like, I'm like, okay, so, um, we're gonna, (laughs) we're gonna finish fifth grade (laughs) at home. (laughs) Um, so yeah, so I think it was just, you know, I, I think it was, it was the same. I mean, I think, you know, I was going through the same thing. Everyone else was, was just, you know, how do we do this? How do you prepare to, you know, to just, to be home, Um, and, um, you know, and to protect yourself and to protect your family from something again, that you just, you know, don't know very much about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, so yeah, it was, uh, like I said, it it was, it was like those early days. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, you know, yeah, it was, you know, it was a lot to manage. Yeah. 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 Do you feel like, um, I recently spoke to a principal and, Mm -hmm. and of a school and he was talking about you know, when you're at work at five o'clock or whenever he leaves, he's done. But during COVID, it's like the work never stopped. He would have to take meetings late at night. And he's like, because there's always these crises and these things coming up all the time. And when you're in leadership, mm-hmm. you're the one that has to, you know, make those decisions. Yeah. Did you feel like that was something similar that happened to you? Do you feel like it just never stopped? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because it was the, you know... Because, you know, also, too, I mean, it's just, you know, the space that we work in, I mean, is, um, you know, I mean, it's a public safety space. So that's yeah. the other thing, too. You don't have a lot of room for error. Yeah. Um, and part of our pretrial uh, division and stuff here are considered essential essential workers. So I did have staff that were still required to be here every yeah. day throughout the pandemic. Um, and the other thing is, too, is, I mean, you know, you know, you know, regardless of what happens in the world, you know, the courts and the jail are always open. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what we do with pretrial is, you know, we've got information that we've got to get to the courts, um, you know, because judges need that information to help inform decisions that they make. Um, If there are folks that are going to be released to the release from the jail for supervision, we're still having to facilitate those releases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there were high COVID counts and, you know, in the jail. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, I had, folks that were still having to do that work. And, 
you know, and, and it was, and that was the thing is like, you want those folks, you know, you want your folks to be safe. You know, I didn't want anyone getting sick again. A lot of things we don't, you know, don't know. We we're also at a point where it was getting, you know, it was really difficult early on to get things that, you know, the protective stuff, you know, the, the mask and, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, it's hand sanitizer, um, you know, all these things that are, you know, were saying that you needed. I mean, it was hard to get your hands on that. But that was the thing, too, is we were following the metrics and following, you know, what was out there. And so, yeah, there was times where, you know, I was on the phone at eight o'clock at night with the health director. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, we're watching these numbers and stuff that are going up at the jail. And, um, you know, I've got teams that are there. We, you know, we're seeing, you know, um, some cases and things that were moving through the courts. And it was just, yeah. you know, being on the phone like, OK, what is it that we need to do? Like, what's the what's the directive? Um you know, because again, you want to, you know, I mean, folks were, folks were scared mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and again, there were just things that we didn't know. So it was, it was a lot of that, like on the phone, you know, um, yeah. you know, trying, you know, making sure that we, we were able to get like the, the best and latest uh, information. Um, but it was also very important, I think too, for the, you know, just with the, with the staff, I mean, you know, everyone was home, mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, there would be times, you know, we always do like, you know, regular check ins on like, you know, hey, what's going on in your division and, you know, following up. And, you know, most of the time those conversations are like, you know, an hour or so. But during COVID, it was just sometimes it was, you know, those conversations were, you know, two and three hours because some of it was just like, you know, just checking in, you know, to see how you're doing, how you're managing. And um, so it was um yeah, it, it was. It just, it didn't, it didn't stop. It just, it started early and it ended late, like every day. So. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember some jails were releasing a lot of people out of jail because of the high numbers of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so if they could, you know, be released early under maybe supervision or not supervision, was that something that happened here too in Mecklenburg County? It was, um, you know, there was definite concern about, um, you know, how quickly or the impacts of the, of the virus spreading in a congregate setting. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was, you know, there was a lot of conversation and stuff amongst like the all of the justice system partners here locally about what were those things that we needed to be doing to try to, you know, um, to do our part, you know, to make sure that we were keeping people safe. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so those were some of the things that, that occurred is, you know, that you had the partners really working together to take a close look at, you know, were there folks that were in the jail that, um, you know, could safely be released and remain in the community. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so, yeah, so that was, that was, that was happening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that there were times where there was, you know, maybe some misconception out there that, you know, like, you know, everybody was just being kind of let out to control the virus. And that was not the case mm -hmm. at all. Um, you know, but there were folks that were in there that, you know, were there for different types of, you know, offenses and things that weren't yeah. necessarily like, you know, threats to public safety. And so there were there was a lot of work that went into, um, you know, taking a look at, you know, if there are folks that don't, you know, that, that could be out, you know, be out in the community and, and safely that would not pose any threats to public safety. Mm -hmm. Then there was a really conscientious, um, you know, effort yeah. to look at those folks and, and to find pathways for them to remain outside of the jail while they're waiting for their court dates. So, yeah, that yeah. happened here, too. And do you feel like <clears throat> I know with the court also being set, sent home for a mm -hmm. season of time, you know, from my understanding, a lot of courts were put on hold until they could mm -hmm. become virtual or start up again. Did mm -hmm. that impact a lot of those that you worked with too? That impacted our work. I mean, that impacted all the justice partners. Yeah. I mean, that are here. Um, Cause I think, you know, everybody was in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, the directive came, you know, stay at home orders are in place. There are mm -hmm. certain court functions that are required to remain open. Um, so, it was, you know, I know the court partners were looking at ways that they could continue that. So things like first appearance courts, I mean, you know, those remain open. Um, but were there other courts and things, yeah, that they end up having to close or pause or, you know, issue continuances? Yes, because, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you had to manage the foot traffic in the building because, again, this is when we were you know, looking at like the, the six feet, you know, of um, the six feet, you know, social distancing and the limitations on the number of people you could have like in a room. And so, you know, that's hard to 
do um, in a court setting. Um, but that was the thing is also is, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think we're CJS, we were de- at a definite advantage in that we had made technology investments, you know, years prior. Yeah. Um, and uh, but not all of our partners had. And so that was also like with the courts, it was, you know, um, you know, our local courts and stuff working with the state to get the technology and things in that they needed in order to be able to do, you know, remote hearings and, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. So it was. Yeah. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Do you feel, how do you feel, so coming out of the initial stay-at-home order and then having restrictions and then now being in a season where restrictions have been lifted, Mm. pretty much most of them, um, how do you feel like that's impacted you here at CJS and then you personally as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, the world is open back up and, yeah. you know, our doors are open again. Um, you can find toilet paper and mask and, you know, all those things. Um, and, you know, and that, you know, and that's been that's been great. Um, but I do think. I think like as a society as a whole. COVID kind of, you know, it, it kind of left people just sort of, uh, you know, like under, a, I mean, I kind of refer to it as like a collective trauma. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody felt it to some degree, you know, people, you know, there, there were lots of people who lost people uh, to COVID. There were a lot of people who had COVID and had, you know, scary experiences with it. And some people are still having, you know, um, you know, long-term effects and things from COVID um, and people are managing that. I think, you know, when we came back, you um, and I think even still, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we've, you know we're 23 now. Um, I think, you know, it is. I think, you know, there are a lot of folks that are still, you know, um, trying to, you know, to manage some things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not everybody came back the same after COVID. Um, and, you know, and although, yeah, the doors have opened and, you know, things are back open and stuff again, not everything came back. And so that's the thing, too. You still have a lot of folks that are, you know, um, you know, still trying to, you know, to 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 manage things um, and not having a lot of like the same supports and things that they had before. Um, You know, I know, you know, child care is one of those things like, you know, child care centers and things are open, but not everybody came back to a child care job. So, you know, that's a struggle for a lot of folks. Um, you know, kids going back to school and stuff and readjusting to that environment has been difficult. So you have a lot of people with school age kids who are also, you know, trying to, to manage that. Um, and it is, I think it's been, um, you know, I think you, you still see a lot of folks that are still, you know, still managing the anxiety and, you know, the, the stress and things that came along with, with COVID. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, um, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly getting better, but I I do think that, yeah, I mean, COVID just, you know, everybody, everybody kind of got scarred by it to some degree. And I think a lot of people are just, yeah, are still trying to, to manage that. I mean, so, yeah. You know, as you mentioned that your nephew lives with you and he's at that age where he was impacted Mm -hmm. deeply by having to do school at home and then maybe having to go hybrid and then going back in person. How Mm -hmm. do you feel like he's adjusted? Yeah. I mean, you know, kids are resilient. I mean, for sure. Um, but that was also, I think for kids, that was also the thing is like, you know, it was just suddenly, um, you know, I remember having the television on and the governor was on there and gave the order that schools are closing. And I was like, Whoa. (laughs) Um, and You know, and so, I mean, that was the thing, too, is, I mean, you know, for kids that not being, you know, school tends to be the place, you know, where you, 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 you know, hang out with your friends the most and you, you know, you socialize. I mean, that's, you know, that's your network. And, um, you know, and so that that was kind of, you know, the thing is that, you know, I mean, it was all also too like, you know, youth sports and activities. I mean, all that stuff came to a pause. Um, So that was, you know, that was that was kind of the thing was, you know how do we kind of manage? It was different, you know, kind of seeing your friends on zoom and, you know, um, as opposed to being sitting next to them in class. But I think all in all, I mean, like I said, kids are resilient. They can, you know, they bounce back. Well, I think they bounce back probably better and quicker than adults do. Um, 
but it was, it was just sort of, you know, we end up being remote for such a long time. It was just, yeah, kind of getting back into the groove of things, you know, being back into the classroom and things like that. I mean, that took some, you know, it took some adjusting. Um, but no, I think all in all, I mean, you know, he's, he's done well. Um, I will say during COVID, I was probably a lot more kind of, I was a lot more loose with video gaming and stuff during COVID than I usually am. Cause I was like, you know, that's kind of like, that's an outlet for, you know, him to stay connected to his friends, you know, they could, you know, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah, did more PlayStation during COVID than we <laughs> ordinarily do. But I mean, again, that was, you know, he was able to kind of stay connected and communicate with his friends and things like that. So that was important. Cause I mean, you know, again, it was just, it was, you know, you don't want them to, you know, everybody was panicking, but you want to try to keep, you know, peace at home. And, you know, mm -hmm. you don't want the kids to know that you're panicking. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so yeah, so you kind of keep it calm, but I think, um, but I think even like with what you've seen in schools that they, as they've opened back up, I mean, you know, it's been tough for some kids yeah. and, um, you know, but I do think, uh, I think it's getting better. I think this, this school year is, you know, it's been a bit more, um, not quite as heavy as last year, whenever, you know, last year being the first year, but he came back, um, so, yeah, I think this year has been not quite as heavy as last. So, you know, they're getting there. But like I said, kids are kids are better at bouncing back than yes. than, than yes. grown folks are. Yeah, they're very adaptable. That's for mm -hmm. sure. Do you feel like there is anything that you personally gained over the last two, three years? I will say and this may sound odd because it was, I feel like it was like sheer chaos, like, you know, that we were functioning in and like, you know, we were, you know, juggling balls and pins and cars and I mean, you know, it all. Um, but at the same time, there was a bit of a calm that came with it. Mm. There was, you know, it kind of, it, it, you know, it forced everybody to slow down. And that was a good thing. I know it was for me. Um, you know, I mean, it, it you know, it, it really kind of, uh, you know, I don't know. It was kind of like, I guess maybe the eye of the hurricane or something. It kind of forced you at times like, like to sit still. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that was, that was a good thing. The slowdown was a good thing. Um, I think the other thing about COVID is COVID said a lot about priorities. Mm. Um, I think societal as well as personal um, I do think that, yeah, it, it really kind of forced folks to kind of think about things differently. Um, again, maybe that, that calm and being able to sit still gave, you know, gave time to really kind of think about like, what are the things that truly are important? What are the things that we should really be focusing on? Yeah. Um, I think that was, yeah, that was good, but it, it was, it was just sort of, it was, um, there was a very, I don't know if I want to say it was strange, but there was, there was a calm that came, that came with it. And that right there was, um, that was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Wise words. Oh. Most definitely. <laughs> and then I'm just, you know, to respect you and your time, I'll follow up with one more question of, do you have any additional stories or experiences that you want to share with us before we finish? Um... You know, about COVID or just general or? It can be either or. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's necessarily any kind of, you know, stories or anything like that. But, I, you know, I think just in general, because, um, you know, with COVID, you know, there was lots happening in society and stuff. You know, um, there was a lot, you know, we also. Um, and I think, you know, the yeah, I think just kind of one, one of the big takeaways of everything that was happening, particularly in 2020 is that, um, yeah, a little patience is required sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you expound on that just a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, I don't know, I guess maybe it kind of comes along with, you know, um, sort of like the calm that came with things. I mean, you know, I think, you know, for a lot of us, we stay on this very kind of like fast pace, you know, it's, the instant gratification, the answer now, you know, um, and we were not in that situation in a lot of spaces. Um, you know, and it was, um, I think, yeah, I think it's just, it, it was just some patience is required, you know, you, you sometimes just have to kind of sit and wait and, 
So you get to that point that you make, you know, make decisions. You've got to sit and wait, you know, for the change sometimes. So, um, so yeah, I think that would, there was probably, yeah, awesome. something to keep in mind. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. For your time today and for sharing about your professional and personal uh, experience. <laughs> no, I appreciate time. I, mean, I appreciate, yeah, the interest in you yeah. coming by. So thank you. Thank you.